In this video, we'll talk about how to log behavioral data that is collected in an experiment. In our discussion, we'll talk about how the Posner task example uses update attribute actions and variable nodes to collect non-eye tracking behavioral data, like reaction time, key press, and accuracy for each trial. The critical components responsible for collecting this behavioral data are in the recording sequence. First, you'll notice that the recording sequence has some variable nodes in it. One of them, SOA duration, is just used to control the duration of the post Q fixation cross, but RT, accuracy, and key pressed are used to store information about the participant's response on each trial. RT is used to store the reaction time or latency from target onset until participant response. Accuracy is used to store the participant accuracy, one for correct and zero for incorrect. Key pressed is used to store which key the participant pressed to respond to the target. Variable nodes always have to be given an initial value, and setting the initial value sets the type of that variable. The RT and accuracy variables have an initial value of negative one. This makes them become integer variables. The key pressed variable has an initial value of a single period. That makes it become a string variable. These initial values are chosen to represent missing values. If the trial times out without the participant pressing a key, then seeing these values in the data file would provide an easy way to know that the trial timed out. They were chosen because the values don't really make sense for an actual response. For example, how could you have a reaction time of negative one? The first node of the recording sequence called reset variables resets the values of these variable nodes to their original default values. If the trial ultimately times out, as it will if a participant does not respond in five seconds, we want to ensure that the values indicate no response and don't reflect response values that may have been set on previous trials. To see and edit how any update attribute action works, you can click on its attribute value list property or simply double click on the node itself. This will bring up an interface with two columns and at least one row. For any given row, the left column, or attribute column, should contain a reference to what we are trying to set, and the right column, or value column, should contain the value to which we are setting the thing that is being referenced in the left column. The first row is setting the duration of the SOA duration variable to a random value between 500 and 2000 and we discuss the details of this in another video. For the remaining three rows, we are making reference to the value property of each of the variable nodes on the left side and setting them to their original default values on the right side. To change a reference or the value that is being used, you can click on the box to reveal the button with three dots. Clicking on that button will bring up the attribute editor and will allow us to make reference to the properties of other nodes of the project. For example, to make it so that we set the key pressed value back to its initial value of a single period, on the left side we make a reference to the value property of the key press node by double clicking on the value property of the key press node, and on the right side we simply enter a single period. Later in the recording sequence, after the participant's response, the values of these same variables are set to reflect the participant's response data. To do so, first, following a participant response, the project must determine whether the response was accurate or not. To do so, after the keyboard response trigger, there is a conditional trigger called check accuracy. Conditional triggers are like if-then statements. You set up a logical comparison for the conditional, and when the project gets to that node, if the logical comparison evaluates to true, then the experimental flow follows the path connected to the little check mark at the bottom right corner of the node. 
If the logical comparison evaluates to false, then the experimental flow follows the path connected to the little X mark at the bottom left corner of the node. The logical comparison is set up via the attribute, value, and comparator properties of the node. The attribute property is like the left side of the conditional statement. And here is a reference to the key property of the triggered data that is collected when the trigger fires. The comparator is the type of comparison we are making for the attribute and value properties. Here, we are checking to see if the two values are equal. And the value property is the value to which we are comparing the attribute property. Here, it is a reference to the value in the correct response column of the data source for the current trial. To put things another way, we're comparing the actual key that was pressed that led the keyboard response trigger to fire to the correct response column of the trial data source. The correct response column specifies the key that corresponds to the correct answer on each trial. Following the check accuracy conditional, we use two more update attribute actions to set the values of our three behavioral data variables. The set correct node sets the same three variables that the reset variable node set, but this time it gives them values corresponding to the behavioral data for the trial. Key pressed is set to a reference to the key property of the triggered data that is collected when the trigger fires. Please note, it's very important to make the reference to the key property of the triggered data of the keyboard response node. In general, anytime you are trying to reference data that is collected from triggers, you should stick to their triggered data, which consists of the data associated with the triggers firing. The RT value is being set by the second line, and it's being set in a bit more of a complicated way. You'll notice that there's an equal sign at the beginning of its value box. This indicates that what follows is going to involve a little combination of information. The INT part and the fact that the rest of the calculation is inside of parentheses following the INT statement means that we are converting the result of our calculation to an integer as the unit of time in Experiment Builder is milliseconds and as keyboard devices are certainly not precise down to the sub millisecond level. Finally, inside the parentheses, we are subtracting the time property of the display target action from the time component of the triggered data that is collected when the keyboard response trigger fires. In other words, we're subtracting the time of the target display from the time of the keyboard response to compute reaction time. Let's remake this entire calculation to illustrate this process, as it's a bit complicated. The accuracy value is simply being set to 1, as this node is on the true path following the check accuracy conditional, meaning that the participant must have responded correctly. The update attribute action called set incorrect sets the values of the variables in a similar way to the set correct node, with the exception that the accuracy variable is set to zero instead of one. The values of all variable nodes in a project, like our key pressed, RT, and accuracy variables here, along with the values of all the data source columns in the project, will be written to the iLink data file automatically when the project exits the recording sequence at the end of each trial. And when the EDF file is imported into DataViewer, they become trial variables, which can be included alongside the gaze-based variables in any of the output reports that DataViewer can generate. So, as long as you have logged the values of any behavioral data you may need for analysis via variable nodes, you will have those values available in the EDF, and thus Data Viewer, for use during analysis. If you're conducting a non-eye tracking experiment where an iLink data file will not be generated, or if you're doing an eye tracking experiment 
and just want to have a simple tab delimited text file that has the values of each trial's data source columns and variable nodes, then you can use Experiment Builder's results file feature to do so. This example illustrates how this works. First, add a results file node from the other section of nodes somewhere to the project. This node won't connect to the other nodes, so it doesn't really matter where you add it. Then, make sure that for the columns property of that node, you have selected all the data source columns and variable nodes you're interested in for analysis. By default, all of them will be included. Then, at the end of the trial, use an add to results file action to write a row to the results file. This way, each trial will be represented by a row in the results file, and the columns will consist of the data source columns and variable nodes you may need in order to analyze the behavioral data in your favorite statistics package.